John, what is that underneath your bridge? Oh, oh man. I mean, I just water picked like a minute ago. I mean, surely it can't be the 10 millimeter anterior cantilever on my hybrid prosthesis, could it? John, there just has to be a better way to treat the edentulous <laughs> maxilla without splinting implants. But I mean, who would we go to if we wanted to, an authority on treating the edentulous arch and the terminal dentition? What about that guy from Spear who teaches that exact course? Darren Deister? I bet he knows. Yeah, and what if we could team him up with Brad the Dental Lab guy and use their combined knowledge to tackle this problem from the platform up? Coming right up this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes, the dental guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. Well, listeners, if you haven't been paying attention to our social media, I want you to go to our Facebook page right now and scroll down to look for the Zerk Gallon Challenge. It's a video of me trying to drown Wes while Wes is using Zerk's Mr. Thirsty product, which is a really, really effective way to keep from drowning your patients. So if you want to take the challenge, they will give you a free trial kit. That's zerk.com slash DG for more information. Well, welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, we are here at Spear Education in the Spear Studio once again for an amazing time. Uh, we have just finished the second day, and yes, we are brain dead slightly, yeah. um, with uh, the treating the worn dentition. We happen to have the lead instructor, Dr. Darren Deister. Welcome to our show again. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Good yeah. to be back. Good to be back. But you know what? We even have Brad, the dental lab guy, with with us this time. Welcome, Brad. Brad welcome to the show. Hey, John. thanks, guys. Thanks for having me back on. It's been a pleasure coming out here, taking the course with you guys. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, actually, just a, a plug for that. I mean, one of the coolest things that we ever get to see are um, interdisciplinary teams working together in these workshops. And so to see, you know, clinicians and their technician um, be able to kind of work through the exercises and, and the thought process and everything. It's it's just really incredibly powerful uh, when you go back home. So well, I'll tell you what's you embarrassing guys. is whenever we're we're told by Bob Winter to just spend time on eight and nine, and we Brad walks over and he's finished <laughs> the upper six. Yeah, you know? he's already milled the final restorations, <laughs> right. and we're like, right. we just barely got the lingual done. Right. You know? Yeah. So, but so, that's good, that John. You, that's what I do. John, that's what I do. We, the last time that we had Darren on the show, <laughs> yeah, it. This this topic come up about a special type yeah. of restoration. Well, John, talk, well, talk to set the stage first. Well, yeah, where I mean, we're if you if you from. if you haven't listened, first of all, I would just say, I mean, if you got a couple hours here, just stop listening to this one. I mean, don't don't really <laughs> stop, I guess, but go back, go back because if you want to really know where this came from, you know, we had Darren on and we we were asking Darren about what his thoughts were, what his favorite restorations were. And that's a hard one for anybody to answer. But he really started talking more about, we didn't expect him to say what he said necessarily about one of his preferences. He started talking about unsplinted, telescopic type of restorations. And I and I almost derailed the entire show. Well, unsplinted in the maxilla. Right, in the maxilla. And I almost derailed the entire show because I, I'm really interested in this concept. And we were uh, at the AO when um, Astra... Uh, unveiled or kind of brought in um, their newest CONUS concept. Which a was a couple years, years ago. ago. Yeah. And, and it was really interesting because, you know, the guy presents it and he's just very, oh, well, it's the best thing ever. It's the best thing ever. It's the best thing ever. And I went right up afterward and I'm like, okay, there's some issues that I see here that could this could be a particularly complex <laughs> type of restoration, even though it looks cool. The guy had a deer in the headlight look whenever we were staying there in the middle of the hallway. Yeah. And he was like, 
Well, there are a few there things. There are a few things. So he, we yeah. were like, we went down to the Astra booth. Yeah. And not to throw Astra under the bus. No, no, but, no, no, no. It was brand new for them. But it was brand new for them. Company. And it was interesting. But so, so when Darren brought that up, we said, okay, when, for the sake of not derailing the entire episode that last time, we need to come back and we need to pick that conversation up, talking about that type of restoration. And I'm really excited because not only do, do we get to hear a little bit about what Darren's doing, but also a little bit of perspective from what he's seen over the years there and from a lab technician side of things. So let's just kind of dive right into that. I want to just have you maybe talk about what this concept is of, because a lot of people are not as familiar with telescopic copings, um, especially with, with regard to implants. If you could maybe just kind of talk through for people that don't know what we're talking about, what is this restoration like? How does it sort of work? Who's it for? Okay, well, so going back in time, right, we had a discussion, uh, I think, last time we were together mm-hmm. about the the idea or some of the challenges that we have with using fixed reconstructions on implants and in the dentulous maxilla, right? Mm -hmm. And so you guys also had Ricardo on the show. And Ricardo, um, Jack Goldberg, Adrian Polini, those guys did a really nice article on the LTR classification system. And so the LTR classification system is going to help us identify the clinical situation based on the tooth position or our optimized tooth position from an aesthetic standpoint and then how that tooth relationship uh, goes along with the lip and then the the ridge, the residual ridge. And so ultimately what you'll find out from that is that if there is a horizontal discrepancy, so there's horizontal bone loss or a deficiency relative to where you want the tooth, mm-hmm. that's when you're thinking overdenture world. Because you need lip support, yeah, essentially. Two, two reasons. One, you need lip support. And now that's not the only reason, right? Because lip support is going to come from the teeth. It's going to come from the prosthetic pink. And it's also going to be supported by the the internal features of the lip, right? So some lips are thicker, some are thinner, some have more um, kind of a, a... like a collagenous kind of a makeup, right? So, so the the visual impact that happens when you move to a fixed reconstruction um, or you remove a flange may actually not have as much of a negative impact as you think. And so, actually, I think it was uh, January of this year. Uh, Avi Bidra and colleagues came out with an article actually looking at that. So okay. they chopped off the flange, removed the flange on a trial denture, and then evaluated the aesthetic impact. Um, and that was evaluated by clinicians, technicians, and lay people, I think, was the, the makeup. So okay. um, really a nice indication that, you know, actually sometimes when you think you need a flange, maybe you don't from a lip support standpoint. Okay. But the challenge is, and you know this, Brad, the challenge is that horizontal um, discrepancy, the horizontal component to the, the ridge and tooth relationship creates a challenge for us bringing the contours of the restoration back to the ridge in a way that is cleansable by the patient um, and doesn't negatively impact. So the lip that let way. me unpack so. that just a little. So you're saying even if you don't need lip support per se, if we follow, say, with what we learn here about EFSB and we talk about where the teeth need to go, or even if you just go back to denture, basic dentures from, from where we've all learned, you're just saying that sometimes you have to put the teeth in a position aesthetically or functionally or from a phonetic standpoint where now they are significantly further forward from the ridge. Even if it's not about lip support, it may just be about tooth position relative to where the ridge is positioned. Yeah, a great example of that is an edentulous maxilla going against naturally uh, natural dentition on the mandible. So you got someone with all their teeth still intact in the lower. The upper teeth, right, you can't cheat them more towards the palate uh, with like you can in a fully edentulous case, um, because you still have to get over the teeth unless you yeah. unless you're willing to accept moving into. So a now class you're actually cantered levered not only maybe based on the implant position from an anterior posterior spread, but you're cantilevered actually from an anterior ridge to anterior lip or oh, tooth Oh, definitely, position. yeah. So definitely two cantilevers that are going to develop there, and maybe three, depending on the horizontal offset going Correct. into Buckle the posterior quarter. teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. right. Interesting. So this is where we would choose to start thinking about an overdenture type of restoration of some type. Yeah, this is typically the world that we'd be thinking of overdentures. I guess the other condition that you would find is someone who's got a high smile line. Okay. So as the maxillary lip moves up, 
uh, you want to make sure that you're able to hide the transition from the prosthetic pink back to the, the natural ridge. So hypermobile lip. Hypermobile mm-hmm. lip or a gummy, someone who would have been a gummy smile patient mm-hmm. uh, ahead of time. So there's um, a couple of etiologies for that. But um, if patients who would have previously had a gummy <laughs> smile, um, you've identified now where you want the teeth to end up, you have to evaluate what they're able to do with their lip because you, do, you don't want to get surprised. So that I think that's a great kind of intro into why we'd be looking at overdentures in general. So uh, tell us a little bit about how, because I think a lot of our listeners, if they've gotten into overdentures, they're familiar with you know implant retained uh, typically dentures, and may, maybe less so with overdentures in general. But we start to see bar overdentures. We've known about them for a long time. I think it's relatively common in the U.S. that we see bar overdentures at least discussed. But this concept of the unsplinted restorations, this is a concept that's not new at all, right? It's not new, but it's yet it's not discussed as much maybe here in the U.S. Yeah, so if we think about, let's say, a bar overdenture. Um, we're still in the maxilla, but a bar overdenture in the maxilla is going to rigidly connect the implants. And so all of, I'll say my training for sure uh, in my grad program, um, but there's just tons of literature to make you think that um, connect, rigidly connecting implants in the maxilla is the way to go. Now, contrast that with the experience that a lot of clinicians have with overdentures is going to be two implants in the mandible using locators to retain the, the overdenture. And so we kind of have had obviously a ton of success with that. And so think, okay, well, I want to do an overdenture in the maxilla, so maybe I'll use locators because I understand how that system works. And the problem is the locator attachment system is resilient. Mm -hmm. It's not a rigid connection. So even if we build a bar into the overdenture, the attachment system has enough resiliency. So the the implant-to-bone interface and the overdenture-to-implant interface is going to be under stress. Mm -hmm. So Contrast that with an overdenture where we've got a bar, right? So everything is going to be rigidly connected. Then the overdenture is going to fit over the top, maybe using something like a a bar and clip design, a hater clip, or Mm -hmm. could be friction fit, a bunch of different ways to configure that. But the implant-to-implant relationship is going to be rigidly connected by the bar. Now, the problem is when you take the overdenture out, you have a bar. So the patient still has to clean that. And those are intimately connected touching the tissue most well, of the time. Not always, but they tend to wind up touching the tissue because this restoration also is going to require a ton of space. That was right. my point, is yeah. that I think that we try to cheat a little bit or we don't plan for that bar thickness. And what we do is we end up making it touch the tissue. And now you're going to ask that patient to use super floss. Yeah. Well, I, I think t- to go backwards in time on that, the, the best approach is, hey, I want to figure out here's where I need the teeth to be. And then based on where the teeth are and how I think this case is going to function, now I'm going to think about where I want the implants to go. And so just like we would do with a fixed hybrid, right. Right. you'd be thinking about developing room. Before you even place an implant. Yeah, before now, the Brad, implants are placed. Brad, yeah. I, want to, I want you to speak to that just a minute before we get into the difference between the two, two different types of restorations we're talking about today is that you have a lot of experience about you, you find that dentists um, need help in the pre-planning stages. Correct. And then you have to s- kind of correct um, during the process if pre-planning wasn't done. Speak to that and what, what you see. We, uh, we do a lot of implant planning from CBCTs. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, when we're doing a pre-planning for the implant, it's always based off of a denture setup first. We try to establish some realm of vertical at that point in time, but if we still don't have enough vertical, we're looking at possible bone reduction, which I I hate to talk about because I hate reducing any bone, but sometimes there's a necessity if we can't open vertical. But, you know, that pre-planning stage before we even drill a hole for an osteotomy is it's pertinent. You have to do that. And there's a lot of mistakes where we'll get a case in. Implants are already placed. There was no Mm pre-planning and we're limited on vertical. I have three of them in the lab right now where I, we've tried to open vertical. Um, it, it, the patient can't tolerate. I don't have enough room to do the prosthesis that's requested. And now we're kind of, we're, we're behind the game. Well, with a lot of your overdentures, uh, would you say that, that you do oftentimes have to bring the bar close to tissue for that reason? Quite often. So you're finding cleansability, you're kind of, you're, you're sometimes compromised. Absolutely. Unless there's pre-planning done where we know what we need to do up front so we don't have to allow the bar to touch tissue. Awesome. Yeah, and so then the challenge when the bar touches the tissue is that you'll a lot of times have gingival overgrowth 
and long term, you may have to come back in and and manage that, right? Yeah, so right. resect the soft tissue because it can be then impinged as the overdenture goes. Epulis around a bar. Yeah, that's amazing. A big problem. That's a big problem. So 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 then w- that brings us right into now. Okay, so we know that we traditionally had had this comfort zone with rigid, rigidly splinting implants, but we run into the problem sometimes of we're trying to, we say, oh, well, it's removable, so it's cleansable. Well, sometimes it's not. It's not really an improvement over even sometimes a cantilevered fixed prosthesis in terms of cleansability for some patients with lower dexterity especially. So this unsplinted idea starts to become really interesting because the cleansability sounds like it'd be much better uh, and then, and we kind of touched on this before, where did you go from feeling that unsplinted implants might be a problem to feeling, because we already know, I think, the answer to this, that, that you know, implants uh, are very successful even in, I mean, we know, for instance, short implants work even with very long crown, uh, crown to implant ratios. We know that that's not an issue. Is that the kind of thing that influenced the thinking towards saying maybe splinting is not that important? Well, I think the change in, in the way that, that I would think about this is understanding the, uh, the connection, right? So we talked about the locator a second ago. That locator connection's got resiliency in it. Mm-hmm. Um, the type of overdentures we're talking about with a telescopic or even like a conus approach, that's a rigid connection. That's a metal-to-metal connection. And so there isn't going to be any prosthetic movement there. There's no there's no resiliency. So the difference between, excuse me, just, just to clarify for listeners, because some, some of them are young, semi-precision, which is locator, right? Yep. Or, and correct me if I'm wrong, semi-precision, which has like a nylon housing or a breed-in or something like that, to a hard precision connection, which is what you're speaking of, right? Yep. Yep, exactly. So that mm-hmm. gives you the comfort zone of uh, more so? No yeah, That it's like a bar in a way? So if you think about this thing working under function, right, you've got a rigid connection now from the prosthesis to the, to the individual implants, and there is going to be a bar that's rigidly connecting all the implants together that is going to be the, the housings are picked up clinically, so you've got a passive fit there. So I know the bar fits passively, but once it's seated, the implants don't know if it's screwed down or if it's held in by friction. That's uh-huh. the key right there. So uh-huh. so it functions like it's a fixed case. Um, the implant to bone stress is all going to be just like it's a fixed case. Um, long-term durability, it's going to work like a fixed case. So you have to think about where the cantilevers are and how you manage all that stuff. But once you remove the prosthesis, you've got individual abutments, and they're super easy to clean and so It's maintain. like brushing teeth for the patient because now they can <clears throat> clean around these individual abutments. These implants are not loaded until the patient puts the prosthesis in. Then that essentially makes it a fixed prosthetic. Yeah, it's totally supported. So it's fixed so- but I want to. Uh, we're talking about this again a little bit more in detail right now. But let's define this, okay? Mm. What yeah, step is, by step? Let's yeah, what yeah. does yeah. this yeah. restoration you, <laughs> look like? You know, so for somebody who's never seen one, what 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 does it sort of look like? How does it sort of work? Um, if you could explain it to somebody who's maybe more familiar with the fixed hybrid or a locator, what what would this look like? So actually, it's. Um, the materials are going to be similar to a fixed hybrid, but let's work from the implant platform incisally okay. or, or coronally, right? So you're going to have the implant, and then you're going to have a custom abutment that is screwed into the, into the implant. So it's got to be an engaging abutment, right? Mm-hmm. Because we need to maintain the rotational accuracy and precision in the implant. So the material selection, we can get into that in a minute, but you're going to have individual customized abutments in, in our design, right? Or, or the way that, that Arian is fabricating these. So... Um, you, you've got the individual abutment, and the individual abutment is going to have a taper to it. And the taper may be zero degrees. It may be three degrees, uh, depending on the case. Um, but in a customized approach, you can customize that. It, with CONUS or pre-manufactured components, that's going to come standard. Yes. The benefit to that is the next step is the coping that fits over the top of it. So in the CONUS pre-manufactured system, that's all obviously pre-manufactured. So we know that the machine components are going to fit really well, um, but we're limited in our ability to adjust them if we want to customize the case. So 
if we go with a customized abutment, now our challenge is we have to make a coping that's going to fit intimately over that abutment. Mm -hmm. So we're using Electroform Gold. Um, I talked with some German technicians in Chicago this year. Um, they've got other approaches, but that's that's what we're doing. The Electroform Gold Coping is, is actually um, going to be formed right to the abutment. So it's not going on an analog or anything like that. It's a, it's a, it's a high precision fit. So then that coping now has got to get inside the overdenture somehow. So what we're going to do is have a rigid bar, just like you would in a fixed hybrid. So we'll have a rigid bar that's going to have some space that's developed inside the bar, and these gold copings will get picked up clinically inside the bar mm -hmm. using a resin cement. So pretty tough to come up with something that's going to be more passive yes. of a fit than that. Um, so the challenge then is everything's going to have to go back to the laboratory, and now you're going to have to rectify the cast to make sure that the cast is accurate to what we found clinically. And then it's a pretty simple process. On top of that, we're going to have acrylic added, and then you can use the denture teeth of your choice. So, so you, you can, can correct uh, by, by you saying that these are custom abutments. I want to talk a little bit about what that means for angle correction, because I think that's been, you know, as we mo move more into tilted implant concept, we've people are more familiar with seeing that. Um, how much flexibility do you get in terms of correcting angulation of, of implants with a customized system like this? Well, I'm going to lean on Arian Deutsch as the technician that I work with on this stuff. And Arian, um, right now in North America, is probably one of the leaders um, mm -hmm. in this technology. So I'd, a plug for a buddy, but he'd be a great guy to have on the show, right? Yeah. Because um, he's actually doing all the stuff. I'm an end user. Um, <clears throat> So I forgot what the Just the what angle, the how much angle correction. Right. Oh, angle correction. Yeah. Okay. Well, at least to give us an idea. Well, he well, really messed like Arian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, what you it's been saying. a long day. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, okay, so let's think about how we would design one of these cases. Yeah. Because we talked about Brad getting in the lab, right? Okay, it's going to be the case comes in and says, here, please fabricate overdenture. And you're like, wow, I wish I had seen this to plan the implants. So these cases, because of the rigid connection and the precision of the fit, they're functioning like they're fixed. And we're going to have to think about cantilevers, and we're going to have to manage all that. So the thought process with where the implants go and how many we need is going to be the same kind of thought process that we would have in a, a fixed hybrid case. So perfect world, you'd go with, I'd say, six in the maxilla. Mm -hmm. um, but you could do four. You could do five. You could tilt the implants, and because they're custom abutments, you could then angle correct um, using a, a custom abutment. Gotcha. So how far can you angle correct? That's a technical question I'd have yeah. to ask Arian, but I um, most of the, um, let's say, like a tilted implant case for a fixed hybrid, if you decide I need to rescue this case and redesign it and move to an overdenture, mm -hmm. um, you would go with a customized abutment that has to go at the fixture level. It can't go on the, the transmucosal abutment level. Yes, um, right. Because obviously we need the anti-rotational capacity there. But you could so. plan a case. I guess maybe the where the clinical side of this comes in is, are you looking at these cases and planning them with tilted implants in mind? Or is that is that more, ch from an angle correction standpoint, is that how you, do you actually say, okay, I don't mind to put an implant in You don't want to do sinus lifts. To yeah. avoid sinus grafting. Is that some, is that Yeah, it's a re that's actually a really good question. Because if you think about what you might try and do with, let's say, six implants, and you're going to use locators, right? If you use locators in the maxilla and they're not perfectly parallel, what You're you find trouble. is the locators wear out super fast. Yes. And then you have, like, it's just a disaster. It's so a disadvantage of that particular uh, particular right, application. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. not a bad attachment. It's just right. it's, we're using it in a way that... that it wasn't intended just, for. Yeah, it's just overpowering the abutment. So, so what I would say is, as I'm doing my implant planning, I would think about, okay, I'd, in a perfect world, I'd have all the implants parallel because sure. it's going to make everybody's life easier. But... In the maxilla, that's a big ask because is it more important that we have the implants all parallel um, compared to the amount of grafting that we may have to do to make that happen? So horizontal grafting, and typically you're going to have to do a sinus augmentation mm -hmm. too, right? So how far can you tilt the implants? Uh, I would say talk to your technician about that. Gotcha. And the plug there is... Um, in, because this is what you said early on in the show, Brad, is when I'm looking at a case like this, the 
first thing that I want to do is figure out who's going to be on my interdisciplinary team. So I'm going to typically need a surgeon. Um, I'll be the restorative dentist typically on the case. I may need a general dentist or someone else. I may need whatever. But I'm going to need a technician. I know that for sure. And I want the technician to be involved in the case design as early as possible. Mm -hmm. So we'll have those kind of conversations. So depending on the materials that the technician's working with, that may influence our tolerance for, for how much angle correction we can do. But we always have to remember that Anytime we're correcting for angulation, it's going to come at the cost of vertical space for the for the process. Great point. That's a great point. So, um, if again, parallel just solves so many problems. If you look at the 14845 uh, testing that was required for implant uh, abutments, they say maximum angulation should not exceed 30 degrees. Mm. Yeah, so. it's funny because if you looked at 30 degrees, you yep. know. Tw- uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it'd be like, <laughs> what happened here? Exactly. Now we're, you know, doing right. it every day. It's yeah. a totally, so, so, like, different mindset. So let's walk through then, now that we kind of have defined what it's about, a little bit about some of the initial implant planning, assuming, let's, and there's a big assumption, assuming that we have properly planned implant placement, angulation, we're thinking about that, say we're using a surgical guide, we know we've got adequate vertical uh, for this. And by the way, I mean, do you plan the same amount of vertical for these as you would for traditional bar over denture? Yeah, what is the vertical requirement? So I asked Arian that question exactly. I said, how much room you need for this? And he goes, it, de- it depends. <laughs> oh, that's a typical <laughs> lab like, comment a, right there. Yeah. Dude, in a perfect world, right? Okay, we're planning this case ahead of time. What do you need? And he goes, I could do it in 13, but, you mm. know, more is better. And so I would kind of think 13 to 15. Gotcha. Wow. But, but he's doing custom abutments or he's cus- doing Custom stuff? abutments, okay. yeah. So, so that's a g- great point, right? Because if you go in the CONUS world, you you're back more. in the same dimensions as a fixed hybrid. Absolutely. And that was so, our point was like when we ran into Astra, we were like, how much vertical do you need? And then we started looking at like, well, that's the amount that we need the for fixed for, right, hybrids. The same for fixed. And so we started talking about the complexity and the advantages and, and disadvantages. And of course, at that time, Astra didn't have a multi-unit. <laughs> so that was kind of the way that they were getting into, I think, more of the full arch world. But so, so let's just, let's say again, we've got our implants in, we've we've got the correct vertical. So you mentioned, you know, the first thing that I want to know, I'd love to know how you how you handle with these cases is is provisionalization mm. because when uh, you're 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 look, I look, I think about okay, we've got immediate denture, and uh, we've got to make a decision when we install these ab- abutments, and we can talk a little about verification, but assume we get these abutments and we're ready to install these abutments. Do the abutments stay in the mouth forever? And if, if from that point on through the rest of treatment, and if so, how are you handling the provisional? Or if the abutments don't stay in the mouth, I'd love to know about how you're handling that. In a perfect world, the abutments would go in and then they would stay, stay in. in. Um, the challenge is because, the, because we're going to pick up the copings in the bar, right? So the risk is you take the abutments out and then you put them back in, and maybe there's a slight rotational slop in the system. Mm-hmm. Sure. So this gets to the implant system that you're working with. Some are more precise mm-hmm. than others. So if I'm the technician on the case, I think I would love to be able to put the abutments in one time, and then they stay there forever. So we're not... We so don't do that. A deep conus connection abutment, we would want to see it and definitely let it stay there because it's a Morse taper and it yeah. ease itself in and so, goes so, and stays in. So then are you using the stock components to pick up in like the, the transitional denture or whatever? That's what I'm That's wanting what to know. That's right. Oh, so you guys it. don't have the answer either? No, we're looking. We are, <laughs> you were supposed to bring that to the table. That's why you're here, buddy. Secret sauce, please. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess if you're in the Konus world, for sure, you could say, okay, well, I'm going to pick up these these housings on top of the abutments in, in the patient's current denture. So you would hollow grind it out, just like you're going to pick up a housing for any other attachment mm-hmm. system. So because, though, it's a rigid connection and you haven't put any kind of reinforcement or any right. bar you pray inside to the there, gods yeah, you're going to ask your will. technician to please you know, That's expedite right. this case because you know it's going to break. But mm-hmm. it's going to break just like a fixed hybrid provisional would. Yeah. So you're going to do a conversion in that way. So we're not, uh, we're just, we're not doing that. Um, so you're taking them out. 
I take him out because I, I want to send him back to the lab because Arian then is going to rectify the cast and he's going to then process everything on the cast. So a perfect world, I, w- I would leave him there. And we're um, working on some, some you, you should get Arian to get his ideas on this, but um, we're working on different ways to kind of manage the provisional. But the time in the lab is relatively quick. So I don't, from a patient perspective, not a big deal to me, but from a um a rotational um, precision. The the abutment's going back into the exact same place, the exact same timing, the exact same everything. Um, that is a, the scariest part of the whole deal for me. So the you know the prosthetic has been verified, aesthetically checked off. Everything's good. It goes back to the laboratory, and then they fabricate the copings, or not the copings. I'm sorry, the abutments and the bar. Okay. And then that comes back to the mouth. You install the abutments, and now you're going to take that bar that'll be internal to your denture and pick that up. And is that cast? Is that a cast reinforcement, or is that milled? Uh, it's typically milled. Okay. So it's titanium. Yeah, it could be titanium. Or um, chromium cobalt? could be cobalt chrome. I, that Cobalt chrome wouldn't bother me at all in this case because huh. it's going to be 100% wrapped up and then insulated to the implant sure. because of the cement. So I have no problem with cobalt chrome in this situation. Um, you could also use maybe a high-performance polymer. So this might be a, a, a time you'd go with something like pecton or hmm. um, you know, trilor or something like that. We've seen Trilor and uh, Pecton. Are you feeling comfortable about these materials in this application? In this application, um, I'm not sure how much benefit there is because right now what we don't know with these materials is I I don't feel confident that we know this yet. Um, the dimensions that we would need for a bar in this application with something like PEC. And I, I've looked at PEC really extensively. Mm. It's, I'm super like hot on that material. Mm. Uh, but we're waiting right now. Um, there's some research that someone's done in the UK. Um, he's actually a PhD researcher. I contacted the university to see if I could get, you know, his thesis. And they're like, yeah, we're going to publish that first. And so as soon as we do, we'll let you know. Right. So um, I, I just have to pause the show for a moment to just point out that this is why we, we like we can hang out, because <laughs> you found out there's a dude doing research on and you actually called before it was published that's like people that want to bid on a home before it's even on the market i just think that's awesome and they and they were like yeah it's coming yeah <laughs> i just think i just i'm sorry yeah I just and, think that, that is, and that's a whole nother show to talk yeah, about those materials that is, right there because yeah. that, that's right. another topic yeah. so I, I think it's a great material i just um i and and i actually have met with uh, one of the the engineers who helped design it hmm. um and uh, they're using it, you know, in all kinds of industries. So it's a great aircraft type of a body material. Uh, it came from aerospace, but I can't find any studies for a full arch application. Mm-hmm. There's some case reports on single units, um, and to me, that's not as interesting. But I, th- I think from a full arch uh, edentulous uh, standpoint, I think it's it's like got a ton of potential. How thick is your uh, 24 karat gold copings? The electroplated. Part. Like super thin. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they're super thin. Now, you pick that up in the mouth with the bar. Yeah, so from the lab, you're going to have the custom abutments, you're going to have the custom telescopic copings, and you're going to have the bar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in order to get there, we've had to make a trial denture. Right. And mm-hmm. then I've had to make an impression, you know, I guess ahead of the trial denture that's going to have the implant position. So we've got in the laboratory a cast that's accurate. Um, we've got then a trial denture that's been fabricated on top of that. And now I'm going to have one appointment where I'm going to try the internal aspects of the restoration in. So the abutments go in, um, kind of make sure that everything looks like it's parallel because these may be milled to zero degrees, right? Mm. Um, insert the copings uh, over the top of the abutments. And then the bar is, is milled with some relief cement relief, and then mm-hmm. you pick up the units. In a perfect world, you'd pick up all the units at the same time. What are you picking them up with? Uh, resin cement. Resin cement. Yeah, so the resin cement doesn't really get stressed. Um, there are going to be some mechanical retention <laughs> elements that are designed into the bar. Um, so technically, I'd say talk to, to Muriel uh, or Arian Deutsch. Um, but the idea is that there's there's very little stress that's going to be applied to that. So it, you could, I mean, don't say pick it up with mashed potatoes, but right. you, it's not really going to stress the cement. So mm-hmm. you need something that's got compressive strength. 
That's good. Is there a little bit of a pucker factor when you're picking that up? No, it's actually it's um, that part is super easy because you can see everything. There's no denture on top of it. Where with the Kona right. system, you're going to pick it up at the end. Mm -hmm. That one is a little scary. Gotcha. <laughs> because gotcha. Having locked a few in, um, not Konas, but other around bars and stuff like that. Like it's um, not a good day. Yeah, not a good day. it changes the nature of how you're feeling about <laughs> it. What's your What's your hard stop for your bar? Because you've got a passive fit bar with relief around these copings. Yeah, right. What what actually stops you from pushing too far? You know, that's actually so that issue comes up with any of these attachments that you're going to pick up intraorally. So even a locator, right? How hard do you push on the denture? Right. So the name of the game is there. If you've got, especially in a, in a maxilla, let's say you've got five or six abutments, it's not going to be moving around like a, a foot. It's it's going to have a little bit of wiggle right, in there. It's pretty precise. And once you put the or cement accurate. in, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna almost drop in. Couldn't, couldn't you know the, from a lab perspective? Maybe Arian does this, but wouldn't you put just a little finger stop and include all those copings? For sure, a, yeah. for sure. So the challenge is um, the bar is typically made in parallel with the abutments and the copings, so right. they wouldn't be done ahead of time. So it slow things down in the lab. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I, that would be a perfect world, right? Mm -hmm. so and you, you could, could cut also, that off too. Cause yeah, you, then you'd right. cut it off, um, and you could make tissue stops. So mm -hmm. that's, that's right. another approach. Just so, pick up some good, reliable so, tissue stops. So yeah. then mm -hmm. that all so, goes so back. So part of it's going to be technician defined, right? But then, so you, so you pick that up, then that all goes back, and they basically just integrate the reinforcement, the bar, into the denture. And then that's and then you're you're delivered. Yeah. That well, right? at that point, they'll go back. You made and that make sound way too easy. Yeah. In the lab. Yeah. Wow. wow. That you is just like that. All we you have finished the case so fast. <laughs> I saw you wax teeth today, Brad. Please, <laughs> please process. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. You, ha you have to make sure that the cast now is a perfect representation of what you have, so that you can get things on and off. So the first step is evaluate the cast, and most of the time, from what Arians. Um, telling me is most of the time he'll go back in and rectify the cast. So that means finding out which implant analog is out of position mm, um, yep. and, and making sure that Reposition that's Reposition of the model. Yeah. That's, a, that's awesome. Yeah. That's an important so step. So you're verifying the model initially when you take your final impression, and then you're also going back after the bar pickup and then re-verifying again? Is yeah, that it's what kind of saying? a belt and suspenders approach. Um, <laughs> I love it. In a, in a perfect world, I... And my goal is to get to Arian a cast that he wouldn't have to rectify. Mm -hmm. um, and so you think about all the, the elements that, that kind of are working against us to have mm. a 100% accurate implant cast. Um, <clears throat> I want it to be perfect. And I'm trying to minimize future work by mm -hmm. clinically doing my part. So I, my, the implants are going to be rigidly connected, and then I'll pick it up just like I'm doing a fixed case with zirconia, right? So this design, this this prosthetic design is actually a little bit more forgiving than working with full arches zirconia. That's, I think, the, the nastiest one. Um, for, would you agree, Brad, yeah, from yeah. a technician oh, standpoint? Yeah, definitely. There's a, you you got to be dead on for the zirconia. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so in the in the zirconia world, you know, a nice idea is to have a, um, did we talk about this before? You have a plaster index come back? No. And so not, you're going to... Not on no, the show. Not yeah, on the show. Yeah. So you have a stone index and if you if you insert the stone verification index and it doesn't break, then the technician would feel like, yeah, this is looking pretty good, so let's move forward with the case. Yeah, plus we, you can't hide it. Because if it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, exactly. If you see some stone floating yeah. to a crack, this, this yeah. isn't going to be the one where you just say to the technician, yeah, it was great, it so was I didn't perfect. send it yeah. back to you, right? <laughs> um, no, I mean it's fair from a technician standpoint sure. to say, hey, look, if I don't get this thing back and know that we're perfect, yeah, then we're going forward. I can move forward with the case. But if it doesn't fit, you're buying the next one. It's pretty so, amazing that, you know, I think you're starting to see stone verification come back. Even in the literature, I started seeing mm -hmm. it show up again. And because it is so, I mean, it's brittle. And so yeah. it's going to tell you whether you're passive fit. But that kind of gets me, you know, I would like to move on to this next thing is like things do wear out and things oh, do yeah, break. Oh, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. And, and I... <laughs> <laughs> you said that like you yeah. dread, yeah, dread yeah, excited to talk oh, about that. Man. No, yeah. I'm just remembering. I I, <laughs> I I I was I was in the lab at UCLA and I'm working on this denture and I've got like this customized arrangement. I stain the teeth. I've got customized pink in the whole thing and and um, 
one of our attending guys comes over, one of really good friend and a mentor, and, and he's like, he's like, yeah, hey, you worked really hard on this, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I did. This is so sweet. You know, I'm taking all these pictures and and you know, like the glamour shots and everything and hero shots. And he's like, yeah, the saddest part is the second you insert that, it's going to start looking worse. So, <laughs> oh, man. So, so get all the pictures now. And I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. I Thanks. went home yeah. like I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, crying. Exactly. Oh, man. But it's true. I mean, this is plastic, right? This That's stuff right. is going to wear out. And, and in a, I mean, happy day, right? The patient lives long enough and That's right. everything's sure. working. They're able so to what's the first? So what's the first wear point? The denture teeth. Okay. Almost, almost for sure. The okay. denture teeth. So if you've reinforced the case, um, you may see some kind of flex cracks happening um, in the base acrylic. But typically on, on a fixed hybrid case the same way, you're going to see the denture teeth wear out first, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, it, from a, a um, technical complication standpoint or maintenance issues, mm-hmm. this is a fixed case. It's just that it's fixed and removable. So mm-hmm. for under function, it's working like it's fixed. So it's going to be under a ton of force. Uh, and so you would think that the weakest link would be the denture teeth. So you could see debonding if we're get a little bit sloppy with removing the wax or whatever. So what about the copings as far as wear? So you would think that, and this was actually this is a great question because that was my first question. Mm-hmm. And this is where I was really skeptical about this when um, when I was first looking at this design. So you would think that there would be frictional wear or abrasion happening uh, between the coping and the abutment. And in fact, that's a, that's an, more of an issue with a conus type of a system where you've got mm-hmm. metal on metal components and there's no there's no butt joint finish line, right? Okay. So with with a customized approach, um, typically we're going to create like a finish line or a margin like you would develop on a crown preparation. And so the coping is going to have a rigid stop. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it's not able to move. I mean, these come with like a five micron fit. It's 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 rigidly connected. Once it's seated, it's not moving. And since it's not moving, it's not going to wear very much. Hmm. So speaking of that, then getting to, to the material selection for the abutment, Arian has found that using zirconia, highly polished zirconia as he's refining the mill, um, done by hand, right? So they come off of a, a mill mm-hmm. and then he's going to take it to a hand mill and finish it. Um, but the the surface characteristics of the zirconia actually wear the gold coping less than a milled titanium or cobalt Because the particle size is so small. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's absolutely. interesting. It's just the same reason why polished zirconia crowns do such a yeah, good job. Yeah, exactly, with the teeth. exactly. That's pretty slick. So the problem is you can't um, manage the same degree of angle correction with the zirconia abutment. Mm-hmm. So then because the walls are going to get thick and you're worried now about the abutment fracturing. <clears throat> so in that case, you might move to a metal abutment, understanding that, yeah, it may actually see more wear at the component level. Now, and do, you, so, do you factor that in from the beginning coping wear and, you know, have a, a second set of copings made? Or... Yeah, I manage that um, exactly what you're about to say. Okay. So, so, okay. I, I, so we'll, I will um, ask Arian to fabricate, please, for me a, a second set of copings okay. at the time mm-hmm. that he's making the first set. Um, because what I don't want to have to do is come back in and remove the abutments and send everything back to the right. laboratory right. or worse, um, have to redo those abutments. It's just so setting the, the cabinet. Just a, yeah, it's just a pickup. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then you're going to pick up new housings just like you would for any other attachment system, or you make a new denture with the new housings, right? So a bunch of different options. Yeah, but I mean, still you're at a point now where if the denture teeth are wearing out and it's a it's a lady, at, you know, you're probably thinking seven to ten years on your denture teeth. Mm, yeah, yeah, if you're lucky. Yeah. I mean, depending on the how the person functions. Yeah, if they're functioning, well, worn dentition, you never right. know, right? Right, exactly. So, <laughs> but uh, if we got pathway wear, we're screwed. Um, but honestly, though, I mean, I think that, you know, of course, our male patients probably wear things out. They do um, a lot faster. So you might be retreading the tires and maybe redoing some of these things in a three to five year time period. But it's very serviceable. Yeah. It seems and like it's so, Brad, I want to know, you know, having had some experience, I know doing Conus before it was customized, you know, but when it was back more prefab, um, you know, was that the same experience that you had with the with the Conus as far as wear, or did you see a lot more problems with things wearing out? And if so, do you think it was because it wasn't custom? Or tell us about that. Wear out as far as teeth wear out, uh, or copings, the the copings, copings wear yes, out. Copings. You know, we didn't see a lot of the coping type thing wear out. Not necessarily. It seemed like their tolerances were built in fairly well, and whatever they're milling out of is you know it's withstanding any wearability of going on and off. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, you know, the, the copings, the gold copings, electroplated, if I remember correctly, it's like 18 or 24 karat gold. So it's very soft. Yeah, right? it's I'm really correct. soft. Yeah. You know, so any of that, it goes on and off. It, it's going to kind of be malleable to whatever mm-hmm. it goes on to. I would assume there would be some potential wear in that, but it's so soft that it's just going to kind of move within it. I mean, that, that actually scares me a little bit less than the typical conus. What I've seen, it was, it was okay. Don't get me wrong. Um, I'd struggle more with the height and the diameter of mm. the stock one. Now the customized ones are, mm-hmm. and so I asked you right away, what type of abutments are we using? It's customized or yeah. not. Yeah. So you custom know. frees you up for a lot yeah, of that. Well, so. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. It's huge. So the, they said the whole concept year, 10 years ago, we used to go electroplate all kinds of different things. So why know? did it go away, Brad? You know, it's interesting. It is. It, I don't know if it's gold pricing that kind of tr- drove it at one point in time. Um, you know, you go to Germany, they do it all the time. Darren, I'm why, to Germany in June and, and we're going to be visiting two labs that are friends of mine and they're they're using Renishaw scanners they're custom milling they're doing Renishaw scanners and scanning the abutment they're milling the actual custom top you know the coping and and, and maintaining good tolerance yeah you know hmm. so their technology and what they're doing for the application is by far ahead of where we are now is this so. concept uh, long-term validated in research that this unsplinted telescopic full arch implant restoration do we have five or ten years of data on that well f- first of all let's um let's back up to the unsplinted yeah, concept. I, yeah. because yeah. because yeah they're individual abutments but once the prosthesis is seated it's right. a it's fixed a reconstruction right. so, so they're technically it. so it's splinted, splinted right. fixed right. we yeah. have to stop thinking of it like a locator unsplinted restoration so essentially you're saying that absent coping wear, they should perform in a similar manner to any fixed restoration. On the well, side. any fixed re- reconstruction that's manufactured from acrylic, right? So right. you're thinking Correct. fixed hybrid. Correct. It's going to be under the same kind of load. It's going to, it's the same type of material. It's got a rigid bar somewhere in the middle of it. Um, you're using denture teeth or maybe customized, you know, you want to use Emax teeth or whatever. You can get cute and try that kind of stuff. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways to, to manufacture these if, if you're finding that wear is an issue. But typically um, in all this stuff, the denture teeth are the weak link. Yeah, so, which so, is a great problem to have. I got to uh, ask. Yeah. going to have a problem. I got to ask on the lab side. So just pricing on the lab side. So your lab bills coming from the lab. Is this kind of the, Actually, the, the yeah, high so, end side of things? So good point. So um, I, I'm assuming, right, like as soon as you say gold, I start to like, oh, it must be super expensive. Um, and then you say custom abutments and custom, and I'm thinking this is going to be like a thirty thousand dollar lab bill or whatever. And <laughs> I, sh- I guess I shouldn't say it. You guys got to edit tell that Aaron. out. Don't <laughs> tell Aaron. <laughs> yeah. so, but but price actually, price. mine will only be twenty five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, price, Aaron's prices are going up. Wow. That's what we're talking. So, so we're negotiating. Yeah. Uh, no, so actually, the, the you think about all the components and the time that's going into this. It's actually it's not too far different from from my lab bill um, compared to a fixed hybrid. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so it's, so it's feasible. Yeah, it's feasible. It's going to be within maybe uh, five hundred to thousand dollars, and then I would order a second set of copings, which is going to be another charge. But right. it's not a, it's not huge. So mm-hmm. it's manageable for patients, and and it's you know the patients I've seen or um, th- that are using these type of prostheses are, are super happy with them, mm-hmm. and part of it is because they can get them out so easily. What so, prosthetic has this eliminated for you in the maxilla? Um. Probably the the thing that I do way less. Um, so Doug Benting is another prosthodontist mm-hmm. here um, in Phoenix that uh, I do a ton of workshops with for the Edentialist Art stuff, and and where we work <laughs> together a lot. Um, so so we were finishing a workshop a couple of weeks ago, and Doug says to me like, he's like, dude. Are you seriously still doing bars in 2018? Like, yeah. I mean, I can see I can see some applications for doing a bar in 2018 because um, there's so many different ways you can configure a, a bar, and there's there's just so many ways you can crack for angle problems, right? Um, so I think there's still some application for bars, but what I really like about our the the customized telescopic approach that I'm learning from Arian is Arian is that. Um, I don't need the same vertical space. Mm-hmm. So in in cases, challenging cases in the maxilla where I've got a horizontal problem and I don't have as much vertical space as I want, um, I'd like to preserve as much of the, the alveolar crest as possible in a maxilla. And so this allows me to work in less prosthetic space than I would need for a bar. 
And part of that is because I don't require the space between the soft tissue and the bar, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm already going to gain two to three millimeters. Yeah. Well, and you're going to mm -hmm. fixture level, so you're going eliminating to transmucosals, yeah. which right. is exactly. again another three to four sometimes, depending on angle yeah. correction. Yeah. I so I hear all of this, and of course, what it brings it back to me maybe is training for this, you mm. know, because it's it's different. It's a different uh, process, and I do see a few, and I, and I wonder, too, you know, from Brad's perspective, you know, I, I start to, and I know when we were first talking about CONUS, and I've heard other labs say that it's been some, somewhat of a nightmare sometimes because of some of these steps, because of verification being essential, because of possibly double verification, rectification, rectification. because mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, intraoral pickup. Um, now, those are things that in a process residency, that's what you do every single day. It's not an issue. Um, where can people, where can general dentists that are maybe interested in this, that have maybe been doing a lot or maybe even prosthodontists who are interested in this concept, where can they learn this? Um, and, and, you know, what are some of the things that after maybe you answer that, I'd just love to know from Brad's perspective, you know, do you, do you get nervous about Very people much. getting? Yeah, you Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, because you know they want to do these types of cases, but there there isn't at least what I've found. I haven't seen a lot of good education on the process. Even though you can download the CONUS manuals and mm -hmm. walk through that, it is amazing how the doctors get tripped up. Yeah, you know. So do, so where yeah. where can people go to learn the process for this? Well, so <clears throat> in in our work here at Spear, um, the approach that I, I'm taking right now is. Um, there are other courses that people could go to to learn one specific technique, so telescopic technique. But what I was never able to find in the continuing education world is where can I go to learn basically all the stuff that I learned in my residency? So how can I learn to critically think about a bunch of different type of prosthetic designs? Yeah. So that's the approach that we take in the workshop and it's the approach we take in the seminar. <clears throat> so I don't go into, Ricardo doesn't go into like really specific detail about how to do any one approach mm -hmm. um, because there are other places to go do that. So if you want to learn this technique, best guy in North America that I know is Arian Deutsch, and he's doing hands-on workshop for technicians. So that's I, like I'm, I'm a clinician, right? Um, I do a ton of te technical work. I, I do it for myself. I do it for other people. But um, I went to the technician designed workshop because I wanted to see the technical stuff. So that's where I did it. And once I was there, then, yeah, we went through all the hands-on stuff. And, you so. know, John and I talk about this so much is that so much of what makes me a better dentist is learning from my technicians and yeah. learning how to do it. And we heard it today right there at the end with uh, when Dr. Winter said that, you know, doing a wax up will make you a better clinician. Right. Going through the, the repetition, process. the and thought it was, process. It's all about the thought process here. It's not like you say, and that's why I think the first thing you said was, let's start with the first thing first, which is learning why would we choose this type of restoration? Do we need this or should we go a different direction? So maybe the first place people need to start is that thought process of, and because, you know, we're, we're... And then secondly, find a good technician, a technician, who can, technician who can or you. another dentist that could <clears throat> mentor you in the, the nuances of the procedure. Because as you've heard over this last 45 minutes... This is not something that you want to take on as your first case. Yeah. Like Brad shaking his head, no, don't do it. No, <laughs> especially you don't want this to be your first case with a technician, right? right. So if I said, hey, Brad, here's, here's a case. By the way, what do you think? Uh, let's do telescopic. <laughs> That's a nightmare, right? <laughs> so so yeah. definitely, I mean, it's a relationship. I, I think of the technicians that I work with. Um, I think of them the same way that I think about the surgeons I work with. I agree. And everyone else. I agree. In the team. I think that's important so, for our listeners to hear. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where. But but I think that that's where we're. And this is against a whole other show. And Ricardo, we talked <laughs> more about that. That show hasn't been released yet because we're we oh, have man. a perfect place for it. But you know, one of the things S that he seriously. And now I want to know what's the deal. Well, he just. I, I'm he, not gonna. We can't spill oh, the entire man. episode. But he, he said just, some stuff. In he there. just really. You know, he got passionate about the fact that, you know, there's there's a lack. Stay tuned. There's, Just there's, stay there's, tuned. Wait, there, John, you cannot. You can't give it up. All you I can't. To, all I'm going to say is that is that there's we've got to do better. We've got to do better in terms of the, the training, the thought process, and being able to actually, you know, uh, own what we do and be the doctor. Yeah, and that's, be the doctor. That's, and instead of instead of letting the industry drive it, Instead of letting the lab, as much no, as it's not no. the lab, it's not, you know. It's, the lab should not be driving it. Yeah, the should lab doesn't need to make it. the decisions. The, the industry doesn't need to make the decisions. The doctor needs to make the decisions. 
And that's, I think, really in the end, I mean, that was what he kind of said in, uh, with a lot more information. And, you know, I mean, do, do, what yeah. do you think on that, Darren? Do you think I, that that's... that's ex- so, I've, I've obviously, I spent a ton of time in Mexico City with Ricardo. <laughs> um, he's one of, like, my best friends um, in, in my life. And um, a friend, a mentor, everything. And um, having spent all that time with him, putting together all of the content that we have here at Spear on the Edentialist Arch and, and how to treat these patients, uh, I can imagine that that's a passionate conversation. So. Yeah, and it, was, <laughs> yeah. it was very passionate, yeah. and there's more to come on that. Listen, if you're listening to this episode and you, you hear us talk about where you can go, one of the best things you can do to get a little taste, and I'm just going to plug it right now yeah. because our listeners have... Uh, we have a landing page set up. If you look in the description link below, if you go even just go to Spear Education's website and you want to join the online community, it's a great place to get started. Listen to Dr. Uh, Darren Deister, Ricardo Matrani. You can listen to Dr. Frank Spear. And if you type in the promo code TDG169, you'll get $20 off a month for uh, the online educational portion, which I believe is a great entry point to just intrigue. And really, honestly, I go back and listen to the listen to your lectures um, and learn something that, hey, I pick up a little bit of something here or, right. or to reinforce being out at the workshop to go back and say, you know, I remember him talking about that. I'm just going to go back and watch what he says about yeah. that. And I think that, it, you know, at this point, you've heard our uh, our episode on uh, cheap but good uh, <laughs> continuing education, right? Uh, because that we've talked about that, if you guys listen to that episode. And, and one of the things we think that you need to find, no matter where you're at in your career, you need to find a gateway to get connected to high-level education. And that can start with something like just an online subscription. But it can also be going to a seminar, which is, you know, a reasonable cost right. that you get a lot from. And then, but you guys do, so you do a seminar and a workshop, right, with this topic in mind. Yeah, tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the seminar, um, we're covering a ton of ground, right? So a seminar would be a, a great option for uh, an interdisciplinary team because we're going to, we don't go into the surgical aspects. We go into the restorative design aspects, the pros side of it. And, you know, the, the, I guess the concept there is still we're trying to um, share a bunch of, of potential options that could be available for a patient. Because mm. a lot of clinicians, right, um, you're going to try and tackle one of these cases, maybe you haven't done a ton of them. Um, you'll call a technician and say, okay, I want to get you on board and do everything the right way. And a lot of times what we find is technicians are biased, right? I'm biased in what I'd like to do for a case. And so I, as the restorative person, I have to have enough depth of knowledge to have a conversation with you about why I think that this design is appropriate for this case. And then if you can see something different, I, I want to have a conversation about that, right? And we'll invite the surgeon into the conversation too. So if everybody's going to see the same case just slightly differently, and there's so much um, power for what we're able to do for patients that way. I think it's so, awesome. So seminar, we're going to just like, like throw tons of information at you. Uh, the workshop, we actually go through um, again, kind of a, a, a similar thought process. We're going to use a bunch of different designs and then um, really reinforce how you would, as a clinician, come up with a thought process for which design that you'd want to go with based on you know the clinical scenario that you have, the patient scenario that you have, and your experience level. And so we go in, in the hands-on component, we go through pretty much exercises that I would say are designed to give you a skill set that would let you do any of these prosthetic approaches. So it's not specific to one approach, Mm -hmm. but the concepts translate. So we're going to pick up attachments. You pick up one attachment, you could do pretty much anything. You got to watch out, right? If there's a bar underneath that, you're going to have to block it out. But I've seen people lock in locators. So that's, (laughs) that's the, that's the design or the, the thought process in that workshop. Well, I think it's it's great it's it's great to get first of all just some some geeking out today, man. man. <laughs> I love I really so man. look forward to that and it was amazing. And and I, I really well, we geeked think out about coffee on the yeah, pre-show. That's really, right. you yeah, guys, if you tuned into the pre-show, yeah. Show, yeah. I mean, it was even yeah. more in depth maybe yeah. than our discussion <laughs> on copings <laughs> yeah. and uh, and wow, I had that, no idea. Well, yeah, yeah, but that's a whole. That's we need to get together and talk more on the riverbank. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> well, we just we really appreciate Darren. We know you're a busy guy. I mean, I, I can't even tell you guys. You know, Darren shared a little bit about just he's on a stretch right now of, of a lot of I time really, this pouring is... into people, teaching. 
you know, a lot of days in a row. And it, and our course has been awesome so far. We just appreciate you spending time with us out of your busy schedule to talk with us tonight about this topic. And Brad also for being with us and, and contributing. It's always as a pleasure. Well. Yeah, always a pleasure. It's been it's been fun. And and so guys, be looking for this episode. And if you've enjoyed what we put out uh, tonight. We want you to make sure you connect with us uh, on social media, you know, hit us up on Facebook, on Twitter, and we also want you to connect with Spear. You know, of course, they're gracious enough to let us use their studio tonight and to, to be connected with them, so hit them up as well. Check out SpearEducation.com. Uh, thanks to Ben also for putting helping to put this together today. We really appreciate it. Uh, so we're going to continue to bring this high-quality content to you as much as we possibly can. We're looking forward to talking again next time on The Dental Guys.